Hi there everybody, it's great to see you all again and today we're going to be having a box opening and review and uh, we're changing scales a little bit. Now you may have seen a photograph of this locomotive on my Instagram and my Twitter feed but this is the first opportunity I've had to actually do a proper opening and review of this so a little something for the Garden Railway, I've not forgotten about that. <laughs> I picked this up um, actually just after Christmas in uh, one of the fire sales that's been going on and it's a locomotive that actually since I bought uh, one in Southern Railway livery for my father for his layout I've really been quite taken with it. It's from Daypole and I'm um, just looking to see if there's a catalogue number. Yeah there is. So we've got uh, catalogue number 7S010 014. This is the O Gage Terrier A1 class number 734 in London and South Western Railway Green. Now, up until now, you've seen all I've got is BR sort of early crest period stock. So you may be thinking that this is somewhat out of place. And you might be right with that, but again, you probably know me so, so well that I have a massive soft spot for pre-grouping liveries. And when I saw this in the, it was actually in the Hatton sale, uh, I was really taken with it and, you know, I had a little bit of money to spare. So I treated myself so that I'd finally have two locomotives to run on the Garden Railway. And uh, one of the things that's caught my eye as well, uh, I've got a little um, thank you slip here, personally signed from Christine Hatton. So, uh, Christine, if you uh, get to see this, thanks very much for that. That's a nice little touch. I do like that. Now, I'm not sure if they're still available at the markdown price. Certainly, um, for quite a while, they had uh, a number left for a really, really good price. Um, so... It would have been rude not to, and I've actually taken the liberty of fitting this with a DCC chip. So I picked the Daypol Imperium decoder, and this is really because this decoder is the one that Daypol themselves recommended to go with these locomotives. And you can't just fit any old decoder in these, because the current draw on them, you'd blow a basic uh, uh, DCC chip that's intended for running with N or, or double O locomotives. Some of the other bits and pieces, in fact, we've got there, it looks to be a speaker um, surround of some sort, and uh, I think, I suspect, that that's a push fit into the boiler, and then the speaker sits in there. But I haven't gone DCC sound with this, and the reason for that is because when I'm running these in the garden, I don't want a cacophony of sound, uh, not least because that would draw attention to the garden railway to anybody on the other side of the fence and not really wanting to do that. So I'm quite happy to have my O-gauge stock just remain as um, uh, DCC only. And uh, they actually run pretty well on just plain DCC. And one of the reasons that I was quite adamant that I was going to go DCC for the garden layout was because of the back EMF function and essentially what that means is that when the locomotive is going uphill or downhill whether it's got a big load on it or no load at all the DCC chip regulates its speed so it is constant and given that the S-shaped layout has upgrade and downgrade that actually a little bit on the steep side that was um, pretty much a, um, a must for me and I've test run these on the Garden Railway this and my pannier tank and actually they've run really really well. Now the livery itself, London and South Western Railway livery, of course, these locomotives were originally built for the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway and they did venerable service under that employ. But uh, towards the end of the LBSCR period, uh, a number were sold out of use. Um, the company withdrew quite a lot of them, but they were still 
very useful locomotives and they sold them on as working locomotives by and large. And two of them went to the London and South Western Railway and this model is a model of one of those. And it's one that um, it, it just really caught my eye. I also like the LBSCR Burnt Umber livery. Uh, but none of those were available at the time that I was looking. But this is one that actually, if the Hornby 00 model had come out uh, at, at the point that I was looking for models in that livery, I'd have probably snapped that up as well. In fact, to be honest, I probably don't doubt that it has appeared in 00 in this livery, but um, not one that I've got in my collection. Now, the O-gauge models are incredibly heavy. When you lift them up, there's a lot of metal parts on these, and it gives them a pretty good heft. And um, because they're so much bigger than the 00 model, you can really see a lot of the detail, and even like small bits and pieces, such as the planking on the wooden floor inside the cab. We've got a very basic amount of uh, detail on the back head there, but these were pretty rugged, simplistic, reliable locomotives um, that the prototypes were. So really that's pretty much in keeping with what the full-size locomotives were like. One of the other features that I want to bring to your attention is inside the cab, there's actually a flickering firebox glow. Now this works on DC and is current dependent and will only come on once the current goes above a certain level. But on DCC, this is controlled via the lighting function. So if you find it a bit irritating, you can just quite simply turn it off. But actually, I find it not too bad. So I'm quite happy to leave it going. We've also got this pretty small bunker on the back and this kind of marks out the locomotive as being an A1 class, that along with the boiler. We've also got on the back this little toolbox and I'm not entirely sure what they would have kept in this but it, it is all there on the model and it really is just lovely and um, more so than the 00 model i have to say there's something about the heft of uh, the size on the o gauge models that really does work tremendously well it's also the case that some of the detail that on the 00 gauge model would be a bit flimsy uh, unless they made it chunkier which on the current hornby model it is a little bit on the chunky side on the O gauge, they don't need to. They can make things much finer and they do stand up to a little bit of rough and tumble. So you can see that we've got the um, the safety valves there are far, far more slender than on the Hornby X Daypole 00 model. We've also got some very, very fine handrails along the top of the boiler there and uh, a whole wealth of other bits and pieces such as the water filler caps, uh, the air vents on the tanks. And uh, we've also got, um, I suspect that these are either the water pump or the injector fittings into the boiler for getting the water into the boiler. Um, we've also got on the front uh, some other bits and pieces there. And they're all nicely done, separately applied, and they really do look the part. Now, one detraction which I have spotted on these Daypole O-gauge uh, locomotives, and it's something that appears to be being carried over into the double O-gauge model that Daypole is making for rails, and that is this very prominent join at the base of the chimney. And it's basically because of the way it's made. And it's something that I've spotted on the Hornby model, the new All Singing, All Dancing retooled version. Hornby have taken great pains to make sure they don't have that join. So if the Daypole model uh, does appear in 00, as the, um, uh, the pictures imply, the CAD work implies, then that's going to be an area that's going to be a big detraction. And it is a shame that on this O-gauge model, we're stuck with this visible seam there. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not too bad. On the underside, we've got a fairly basic, actually, underside. We've got the brake rigging there, all factory fitted. And these are actually made of metal rather than plastic. But unlike the pannier tank that we reviewed some time ago, 
there's no internal motion there to see. It's very, very basic indeed. But in all honesty with you, the motion on the uh, the pannier tank I found to be a bit of a gimmick. Yeah, it's lovely and it goes round, but you're never going to see it unless you hold the locomotive upside down, which just struck me as being detail for the sake of detail. In terms of couplings, we've got the three link uh, couplings there, um, factory applied, sprung loaded, but there's no mounting points as far as I can see at all for um, any other types of couplings. There's no NEM pockets or anything. So if you're wanting to replace these for something else, I'm not really quite sure how you'd go about that. But that said, in O-Gage, the three link, the instant stanter couplings are actually pretty reliable and possible to use. It's not like in the smaller scales where you're really making a rod for your own back. We've also got um, what appear to be vacuum hoses, factory applied, and because we haven't got a big tension lock coupling, these don't get in the way of anything. So it's really nice to see. In terms of other detail, uh, one of the things that I've picked up on, the brake blocks on these are as per the earlier A1 locomotives, as they should be, and it's another of the detail differences that you can spot between different members of the Terrier class. Uh, the, certainly by the time they reached BR service, these were all getting swapped out for something somewhat more conventional brake blocks, and these look to be like they might actually be models of wooden brake blocks, which... Um, Probably not the best of things. The actual paint finish is incredibly sharp. We've got this lovely London and South Western Railway green and the shade seems to be spot on. I've seen LSWR livery from like a very light pea green to quite a dark green and I suspect that there was a lot of variance on the prototypes anyway. But this particular green, just to my eyes, looks absolutely right and it's, it's a good match for the London and South Western Railway M7 that Hornby produced some time back. Um, so, you know, I, I really like it. The lining, again, really, really sharp, and we've got the white and the black and the brown bands, and they're all perfectly parallel to each other, as you'd expect, but of course they're applied with uh, a tampo printing process, where no doubt there's multiple passes to build up the different colours, so there'd be a lot of opportunity for them to become misaligned, but they don't appear to have on this model. The LSWR lettering and the number 734 have this sort of shadow relief in black and it is nicely done. In terms of other detail, we've got metal connecting rods and these are really quite delicately done. And you can even see the detail for the oilers on the top there. And uh, uh, really, in terms of detractions, the only th thing that I can really put my finger on is that seam on the chimney. Everywhere else, there's no real parting seam for the mould on the boiler. Um, nowhere else can I see any signs of compromise being made. So it, it just is a shame that Daypol have chosen to have the chimney as a separate piece. Cab glazing, it has front and back and Again, in O-Gage, it's possible to do it so, so well. They're absolutely flush fitted. And um, I'm looking on the inside, there's there's no glazing bar like we've seen on, for example, the Hatton's Andrew Barclay or the P-Class. It's just done perfectly as per the prototype. I'm just having a feel of the cab roof and it doesn't lift off. You saw with the pannier tank that the cab roof was designed to lift off for ease of putting a crew inside there, but you don't get that with the Terrier. It was the first O-Gage locomotive that Daypol brought to the market, so I think that uh, there has been a steady improvement as the later models have come on through. But certainly the Terrier model is a really good starting point in their O-Gage range. We've got fully sprung buffers all the way around, although these do have a habit of getting stuck in if you're not careful, like you see there. The springs aren't very powerful on them, and that can be a little bit of a detraction as well, because when you're running an O-Gage, the sprung buffers are actually quite essential, because running with the three-link couplings, the buffers do tend to rub against each other, uh, just as they would on the prototype. So the fact that these springs aren't exactly the strongest is 
another minor detraction. Underneath the boiler there is a gap all the way through and there is a very basic representation of the inside uh, motion uh, for the valve gear but it's not it's not full relief it's just a suggestion of it being there but actually overall I have to say that this this locomotive gets a good solid 8.9 out of 10 from me the livery is wonderful and uh, it has been produced in so many different liveries from British Rail all the way back to the original London Brighton and South Coast Railway livery but this particular livery it just really took my fancy. So I can well recommend this model and certainly if you're on a budget they're available brand new for anywhere down to, I've seen them as low as about £140-£150 so really you can't say better than that. Well I hope that was really informative to you. Don't forget to like this video, that's really super important and also share it too if you think uh, you know somebody who uh, might appreciate being able to see this video too and if you've not already done so don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. But until next time thanks again for watching and this is me Jenny Kirk saying you take really good care of yourself and I hope to see you again next time. Bye for now. Today's video has been brought to you in part thanks to the generous donation of my fans on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Mark Anthony, Michael Churchwood, Mark McShane, Bob Threeton, Alec Ralph, Anthony Hunt and William Wade. If you'd like to help support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash Jennifer Kirk. Thank you. Today's video has been brought to you by my books, Bringing Home the Stars, Twinkle Little Star, and also you can get the complete comic collections of All Over the House, Books 1, Books 2, and also the wacky zany Life of Nobty Mouse. Thanks and catch you later.